uh, and I hope that you've already experienced it, but if you haven't, um, I want to talk to you this morning to start about the Rocky movies. Have any of you guys seen Rocky or Rocky 2 or Rocky 3 or Rocky 4 or Rocky 5 or Rocky Balboa or the new Rocky movie that hasn't been released yet that's coming out this fall? What? Yeah, so exciting. I love the Rocky movies and one of the, if you guys haven't seen them, uh, that don't be ashamed or beat yourself up about it, it just means that you're not that old. But they're great. Um, they're great and it's really an underdog story about a boxer. Um, a guy who's from Philadelphia and he doesn't come from a, a great background and he overcomes a lot and he works really hard and perseveres and it's, it's really a story about, about courage and, and working hard and pressing on. One of the funny things about Rocky though is even though it's a movie about boxing, if you talk to people about it, almost everyone's favorite part is not him boxing, but him training. At a certain time, he starts working out and the music starts building up and you know, you're like, oh yeah, this is getting good and then the music starts, he starts running or like hitting stuff and I, I like that and, and I think everyone should and it gets really exciting and, and one of the most uh, amazing parts of the movie is, is the training sequence, getting ready for the fight. And it's amazing to me that so many people relate uh, to the training and get more excited about the training than the actual boxing part of the movie. And it, it is inspiring and it, it makes you want to go exercise and, and that's all good. The reality is that training normally isn't like it is in Rocky, you know, in, in that he starts, you know, running and everything's great and it's like a big celebration where we know that, you know, exercise training normally means like sweating and getting really exhausted and feeling horrible and you know it's painful and there's normally not a band behind you like you know those kind of things but there's a great truth in that and that is that the preparation that Rocky does puts him in the position that he is uh, to fight the good fight. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about uh, the first Rocky movie, I'm gonna give it away, uh, is that He's not trying to win. His goal is just to fight the good fight, to fight as, as well as he can, to do uh, everything he can, to give all he's got. And the preparation that he does is what allows him to do that. Um, the preparation that he's involved in puts him in a position to fight as well as he possibly can. And for us, uh, what we want to do today is kind of look back at King David and see what his preparation was like because his, his life didn't start with the story of David defeating Goliath. Uh, we jumped in there yesterday because that's a great entry point that people know about and that a lot of us can connect with and are familiar with, but David's uh, story of faith did not begin with him defeating a mighty giant. Uh, his, his story starts with obedience and faithfulness, and, and these things came from preparation. And when he was ready, the time came. When we're talking about David, I love how one author says this. He says, the scene of David's triumph, triumph is not the beginning of his story. That beginning is rooted in the silent years David spent as a shepherd. It is rooted in the fear David must have felt of the wild beasts around him, and in the courage that was tested over and over again as David went out to meet his challenges. It is rooted in David's growing awareness and trust of God. David's work as a shepherd prepared him to be excellent as a warrior. He was learning and he was growing when he was out in the field, and God was preparing him to be used for what God was ultimately going to do. And first and foremost, what David was learning was God. David was learning God. And this morning, if you would turn there, we're going to look at Psalm 23. Um, this is one of the most famous passages in, in the Bible. In fact, if you look at the statistics, it's one of the most Googled Bible passages every year. Uh, it's one of the most memorized Bible passages. 
It's been made into many songs, and it's one that we're going to kind of dig in today because I think oftentimes we can uh, read some of what the Bible says and we're so familiar with it that it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other or in out our mouths without our brain knowing what we're saying. Uh, we just want to kind of dig into Psalm 23 and, and find out a little bit more about what it says about David, who he was, and how he prepared. It says... The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me, before me, in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. When we read this, we can recognize that there's so much there. We can see that David saw clearly that God was close by, that God was with him, beside him, before him at all times. We can see that David saw the goodness of God, that the, the Lord gives food and water and satisfaction and so much more. Let's kind of like look a little closer. In the field, David learned and leaned into the truth that God was with him. If you look at verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is, is with me. That the Lord was beside him. The Lord was before him. He experienced and understood that God was the one providing his food, his drink, his strength. He says that God is the one who provides his guidance, his comfort, his satisfaction, and ultimately the meaning to his life. And these real life experiences are what shaped David as a person. And they shaped him in three important ways. And these are what I want us to really kind of look at today because I think that we can learn from them. Number one, we can see that uh, we can take a look at David's priorities. We can look at what was important in his life. We can see that his number one priority was closeness with God. That he prioritized being near to God above all things. And that makes sense because if the Lord is, is a shepherd, that's how a sheep would stay safe. And that's how a sheep would know where to go. That's how a sheep would know how to get food. That's how a sheep would know how to live every aspect of its life in the best possible way by being close to the shepherd. And we can see that David's priority was to be close to God. And he, he lived this out through integrity, uh, through holiness. The other thing that we want to look at is his posture. Our posture is what position we put ourselves in. And a lot of times we don't really think about posture unless you're sitting like in some kind of weird way. Um, my wife and I talked a lot about posture this past year because we, we, we had like some neck problems and stuff. We had to go to the chiropractor and it's terrible. And um, our chiropractor was great. If you ever watched this, you were great. Um, but um, the, the pain and the difficulties from, from our posture wasn't so great. But there's other kinds of posture that we need to think about. When you play your instrument, you might think about your posture. Uh, when you have your, your lessons or when you go to band or orchestra, you might see the, the director you know, call you to be ready, right? A, a posture of readiness before you start playing. You know, they don't just like get up there and like s start, you know? They, they put you in a position to succeed because if you didn't have the right posture, you, you wouldn't be able to do what you needed to do at the time that you needed to do that thing. And so for us, we need to be able to recognize that David had a posture that put him in a position to be ready to do what God called him to do. And what really defines David's posture is having a, a, a posture of worship. He put himself in a position all the time to see God for who God was and to respond in the right way. So we, look, we want to look at David's Priorities, his posture, and then the third thing is practice. What you actually do, your actions. And we can see that David's practices were in accordance with those first two things. Because of his priorities and because of his posture, 
His practices were to praise God, you know, with his, with his harp and with his voice, to, to do hard things, you know, to, to protect the sheep from lions and things like that, to go to work every day, to believe God and to obey him in the big things and the little things. And all those things put together really make up our life of faith. Um, what is important to us, what position we put ourselves in, and then what we actually do. And young David was faithful when no one else was looking, with his priorities, his posture, and his practices. He fought lions and bears when no one was watching him. He practiced harp when no one was looking. You know he must have practiced with his sling when he, when he launched that stone towards Goliath that was not his first time. He was ready. A servant of God, or a servant of any kind, is deemed faithful based on the opinion of the master not by anybody else who's watching. God assigns and we respond. God leads and we follow. And that's what David was living out. And in God's wisdom, he prepared David to succeed when he put him in a position that was challenging. And he does the same thing for us as he worked as a shepherd. Picking up stones, going to the field, proclaiming and praising God. And when facing... When facing Goliath, the stage was different, but all of the activities were the same. He picked up stones in the morning to be ready for what God had called him to do that day. He faithfully went into the field to do the job that God had called him to that day. And trusting God's design would prevail, he praised God with his words, declaring the truth of who God was. He did the exact same things when he combated Goliath as he did every day when he went into the field as a shepherd. And that's the reason why he was able to be so successful. He was armed with more than just a sling and five stones. He was armed with truth. He was armed with a right view of reality. He saw clearly that God was always with him and that God was always on his side. And this is the game changer of the Christian life. That God is with his people. If you could sum up all the things that I've mentioned so far, and I know it's a lot, you know, our, our priorities, our posture and our practices, all those things aimed towards one thing, one thing. And that was for David to live closely and respond rightly to who God was, who God is. And if, if you remember from our psalm, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. And if you recall how the battle with Goliath began, there were, there were two armies lined up. And this battle took place in the valley of Elah, where the giant was waiting. A giant was waiting to deal out death to whoever would come forward, literally this was the valley of death, the darkest valley. And David was ready for it because he was already connected with God. He had already organized his life, his priority, his posture, and his practices. So he already knew that whenever the valley, the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death came, whatever that might be, whatever situation, he was prepared to go in because he was close with the Lord. The Lord of angel armies was with him. So he didn't tremble like his countrymen when he went into battle with Goliath. He didn't cower like King Saul. He was prepared. He had practiced. He was ready. Because his life was built around closeness with a God who never loses, with a God who never fails, and with a God who never makes a mistake. And because his daily practices were built on his worshipful posture, which was built on his relationship, his priorities, those practices carried him through. God's people, the whole region, saw that there was a God. Everyone recognized that there was a God in Israel because David was able to live out what he had been living out in private in public. If you want to be a person who changes the world... Change your own priorities to press into Christ, to know Him, to live closely with Him, 
and to follow him wherever he leads. And so what we want to do now is turn the focus from David to us, to shine the spotlight on our heart, to look at our own lives and consider what it means for us to be people who live close with Christ. And that's what I would like to ask right off the bat for you to look inward and answer this question. Is your priority to be close with God? If the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, is your life aligned so that the greatest command is your greatest desire? Is Jesus' greatest call on your life your most important priority? Is your posture one of constant worship, even in the daily grind or doing the things that you don't necessarily want to do? Are you a person who, who actually lives out, puts yourself in a position to praise, to worship, to thank, to honor God by the way that you live? And are your daily practices allowing you to live every moment close to God? Or are you practicing things that drive a wedge in your relationship? Are you somebody who's, whose daily habits, thoughts, attitudes, actions, the things that you live out all the time draw you close to Christ? Or are you somebody who maybe says the right things but lives far away from Him? See, God wants to use each one of us to give Him glory. He wants people around you to see from your life that there is a God in your city, a God in your family, a God in your community, a God in your friend group, a God in your school. That's what happened when David lived out, so that everyone could see that there was a God in Israel. Because one man lived out his closeness with Christ. And he's preparing you now. He's working to shape your priorities, your, your posture and your practices so that you will be ready when the time comes for you to be tested. Or you will be ready when the time comes for your faith to be put on display. And hear me clearly. I'm not saying that you need to just work harder or do better or fix your routine or read your Bible more or pray more because that will make God love you more. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that God is ready to work in and through your life if you will let him. Romans 12 says that we shouldn't let the world squeeze us into its mold. But we should let God shape our life by renewing our minds. We need to let God shape our lives through closeness with him because he has come close to us. You know, we really live in this amazing privileged position where Jesus, the shepherd, has come close at great cost. One commentary says that Christians cannot read David's words in Psalm 23 without having their thoughts immediately rise to the words from the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is the amazing reality of the gospel that there was a God who left all the glory and perfection of heaven and stooped down low to come close to you. That there was a God who entered our broken, disgusting, messed up world to come close to you. That there's a God who, who is willing to give up his own life through horrible agony to come close to you. In order to come close to you, God has done so much. He gave his life. Will you give your life to be close to him? Will you organize your life in a way that causes you to remain close to him? Will you put your posture in a position so that whenever the opportunity arises, you will press closer and closer and closer because God is what you really want. Because you recognize the truth of the gospel that, that God did something for us that we could never do, we could never earn, that we absolutely don't deserve. Because he values you. And he wants you to be near. But a relationship requires us to turn, to press in, to be close to him as well. 
Don't you want to be able to say with honesty and joy that the Lord is your shepherd, that in Christ you have all that you need, that he brings you rest in green meadows, and that he leads you beside peaceful streams? Don't you want to be able to honestly declare that he renews your strength, that in all situations he guides you along the right paths, that he will bring honor to his name through you, and that even when you walk through the darkest valley, the most difficult situation, you never have to be afraid because God is close. He is beside you. His rod and his staff, which are mighty, protect you and comfort you. And he will prepare a feast for you, even in the presence of your enemies, and he will honor you. He will anoint you. Don't you want to be able to believe, to say, to live a life that overflows with blessings, not because we believe that God is here just to bless us, but because the greatest blessing we could ever have is to have him close? Don't you want to be so close that you can declare, that you can believe, that in every day, in every circumstance, in every tough situation, you can say that surely God's goodness and his unfailing love will pursue you, will chase you down every day of your life, and that you get to live in the house of the Lord forever close, close. Because that's where God wants you to be, because he loves you and because he recognizes that that is exactly what we need. I'd like to challenge you guys today. Do not think that you can live this Christian life without Christ. Think that you can live this Christian life by doing or saying the right things. It cannot be done. There is no Christianity. There is no Christian faith without Jesus. That doesn't, that means that you can memorize scripture. That means that you can know all the songs. That means that you might even be able to tell your friends about Jesus. But if you are not close to him, if you don't love him, when the trials come, when the difficulties are there, things will fall apart. You know, Jesus said that the person who hears God's word and doesn't put it into practice is like somebody who builds on a beach. And the storm comes and that sand washes away and their life falls apart. But the person who hears what Jesus says and puts it into practice is like someone who builds their life on a firm foundation of stone. And whatever comes your way, the biggest storm will be the smallest thing because there's nothing that competes with God. And when you are close with him, the Psalms say that he will protect us like a, like a, a mother bird putting you under the wing. Hear this challenge. Don't try to live your life to be good. Don't try to live your life to be the most Christian. Live your life to be close with Christ. And all those other things will fall into place. Will you guys pray with me? God, I pray for the students for the counselors, for the faculty who are here. I pray for the people who might watch this online. I pray for myself. That we would be people who want to be close with you and that we would organize our lives so that that can actually happen. God, don't let it just be words that we say. Don't let it just be songs that we sing. God, don't let our faith just be activities that we participate in at camps or on the weekends. Bring us close to you. God, I pray for the students here today who don't know you. I ask that that you would work in their lives today and that, that today, 
today, they would come to, to give themselves to you, to draw close to, for the first time, and for their lives to be changed. God, I pray for the students here who know you, who, who have followed you for a long time. I, I ask that you would renew a deep passion in their lives. That they would want to be near you, that they would want to know you, that they would love you. God, don't let it grow old. And don't let us forget. We ask that you would do mighty things in our lives and in our hearts today. And we know that you will because you are a great God who does great things. So we ask that you would draw us close enough so that we will be right there, up next to you, pressing into you. And we ask that you would do your great work in our lives. We love you, we praise you, and we're excited to see what you're going to continue to do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Thank you guys so much.